This video is not about your average archaeological discoveries. They're ten a penny, and most of them would have only be of interest to another archaeologist. Instead, we're focusing on outstanding discoveries. We're looking at the kind of finds that are so weird or so magnificent that they stand out from the crowd. We've got plenty of them to show you, so make yourself comfortable, and let's get started. We did promise you the weird alongside the magnificent in this video, and we're starting with the very weird. In 2014, archaeologists in the medieval town of Odense, Denmark, had the unpleasant job of opening several barrels of 700-year-old human feces. After opening the barrels, the experts confirmed that they'd done an outstanding job of preserving their contents. To put that another way, they mean that the human waste still stinks. The barrels were found during the largest urban archaeological excavation in the history of Denmark. It's an area full of old brick and half-timber houses, ancient stables, and other facilities, including what appears to have been the town's old communal toilet. You might be wondering why would anybody want to open the barrels? The answer to that is that scientists wanted to find out more about the diet of the medieval residents of Odense. Turns out that they ate a lot of raspberries, and they used scraps of moss and leather as toilet paper. We can only hope that the archaeologists thought those revelations made their efforts worthwhile. Here's another 700-year-old discovery. In March 2011, road workers in China came across this incredibly well-preserved Ming Dynasty-era mummy after digging up a road to expand a street in Tazao, Jiangsu Province. Based on the beautiful silk and cotton she's wrapped in, she was probably a high-ranking member of the dynasty that ruled China between 1368 and 1644. The unique circumstances of her burial have treated her body so well that her face was still fully intact when she was found. She even still had her eyelashes. She looks almost as if she died only recently. Her excellent state of preservation might be at least partially due to the unidentified brown liquid inside her coffin. Her soft shoes are preserved even better than her body is, still so soft that they could be taken off and worn by someone else almost as if they were new. Historians believe that this particular method of mummification was used only for very high-profile funerals, which makes it a frustration that we haven't been able to identify the woman. 700 is our lucky number today, because we've got yet another fantastic find from 700 years ago. It's difficult to imagine that people living seven centuries ago used banknotes because we so often think of our ancient ancestors using coins as currency. But they used banknotes all that time ago in China. We know that because we found one. The Ming Dynasty banknote was found hidden inside a 14th century wooden Buddha sculpture in Australia in 2016. It's to be presumed that the parchment banknote, which is one of the oldest examples of printed currency in the world, was slotted into the cranial cavity of the sculpture for safekeeping and then forgotten about. The bill carries the three official seals of the Hongwu Emperor Zhu Yanzheng and a line of text that confirms that it's authorized by the Department of Finance and is as valid as any coins. It also warns that anybody caught making or using counterfeit banknotes will be beheaded. So it seems that counterfeiting banknotes was a problem even then. The value of the banknote is one guan, which was the highest denomination of the era and was equivalent to one liang of silver. The lucky finder sold it at auction for a little over $35,000. Well, should we have another 700-year-old discovery? Well, <laughs> why not? This one's a little larger than the ones we've looked at so far. It's the Larabanga Mosque in Larabanga, Ghana. It was the first mosque to be built in the country, and because of that, it's sometimes called the Mecca of West Africa. Legend has it that the mosque was built by a Moorish trader called Ayuba, who spent a night in the village in 1492 and received orders from Allah to build the mosque while he was dreaming. The original mosque was built from mud and reeds and contained separate entrances for men and women, plus a third entrance reserved only for the music. 
By the 1970s, the old mosque was badly dilapidated and in desperate need of repair. A botched reconstruction attempt saw cement applied to the walls in the hope of strengthening them, but the moisture penetrated the old wooden beams and led to a termite infection. The weakened structure then collapsed during a storm. It took the combined efforts of the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board, the World Monuments Fund, and private backing from American Express to put it back together again. In May 2011, an archivist in the Swiss canton of Nidwalden set about the task of restoring the cover of a medieval book of court records. When he opened it, he came across a set of 9,500-year-old playing cards hidden inside the cover. The cards are an early example of the type used in the game Jazz, a card game so important in Switzerland that it's considered part of the country's national identity. Important Joss games are even broadcast on live television. The cards were probably made in Basel during the 16th century from a light cardboard-like material. They were probably hidden because it was illegal to play with them. Many card games were banned in Nidwalden by 1572, with a fine of 10 gold pieces if you were caught playing them. The only exceptions were tarot cards because they were believed to have a specific use. Joss is a little like poker, with the cards having four suits represented by acorns, flowers, shields, and bells, divided into kings, farmers, banners, and then number cards. This ancient pack is now safely stashed in a museum. Way back in 1231, St. Anthony died of edema, a painful condition that causes swelling all over the body. He was buried, but he was then exhumed in 1263 so he could be reburied in a new basilica dedicated to his memory. Legend has it that when he was exhumed, every part of his body had decomposed to nothing apart from his tongue. The tongue was said to be as wet and flexible as it was when he was alive. St. Anthony was noted as a gifted orator who converted thousands of people in France and Italy to Christianity so there's probably more than a little poetic license to this tale, but his tongue still exists today. It's in the Basilica of St. Anthony in Padua, Italy, and it's contained in an extremely elaborate golden reliquary. His jawbone is also contained in the reliquary, so the story about everything rotting away apart from his tongue is obviously nonsense. The rest of what's thought to be the saint's body is separately entombed elsewhere in the basilica inside a private chapel. The Basilica also boasts sculptures by revered artists like Giotto and Donatello, but it's the tongue that draws the most pilgrims to the building. He's the patron saint of lost things, so the faithful come to seek his assistance in finding whatever they may have misplaced. It's likely that more languages have been lost than are still spoken in the world today, but every now and then one of those lost languages is found again. We can see one here, on the back of a 400-year-old letter that was discovered in 2010. The back of the letter is covered in notes created by the letter's Spanish author. According to language experts, the notes constitute the author's attempts to translate a language that was once spoken by the indigenous people of northern Peru. Spanish numbers and Arabic numbers are shown next to symbols that scholars have never seen before suggesting it's a language that was known at the time, but isn't today. Some South American linguistic experts have suggested that there's a resemblance between the unknown language and Quechua, which is still spoken by some people in Peru today. So if the resemblance is passing at best, the language is likely to either be Pescadora or Quignum, known only by their mention in the record of Spanish conquistadors who described them as the languages of the fishermen. Some scholars believe the two languages might actually have been one and the same, and if they were, we might be looking at it on the back of this letter. William Shakespeare is regarded as the greatest writer of all time, so it's incredible to think that some of his work was banned while he was still alive. It was, though. And to be specific, it was Shakespeare's contribution to a play called The Book of Sir Thomas More. Shakespeare wrote a 147-line-long monologue for Moore in which he backed the cause of immigrants. 
This was pertinent in the England of the time because in May 1517, riots broke out in London in protest of the presence of Flemish laborers and wealthy Lombard bankers in the city. The immigrants were attacked with bricks, stones, and boiling water. Thomas More, the deputy sheriff of London, risked his life by trying to persuade the rioters to go home. The event became known as Evil May Day. In the monologue, Shakespeare invites the audience to imagine the immigrants as strangers with babies on their backs and poor luggage, and imagine where they themselves would go if they were oppressed. He goes on to accuse the mob of mountainous inhumanity. The play was immediately banned by the Queen's censor Edmund Tilney because of fear that it might incite more riots and was never performed during Shakespeare's lifetime. You probably wouldn't think much of this wooden canoe if you saw it washed up on a shore in southern Mexico. It looks a little old and battered, and if you thought anything about it at all, it'd probably be that the canoe was no longer fit for its purpose. You'd be right. But we think the canoe looks pretty good for its age. After all, it was made more than 1,000 years ago. The canoe was found during the creation of a controversial new tourist-focused railway in Mexico called the Maya Train, which will ironically destroy a lot of locations used by the ancient Mayans. The five-foot-long canoe is itself Mayan in design and origin. It was found totally submerged in a freshwater pool not far from the famous site of Chichen Itza. Archaeologists also found ceramics, a ritual knife, and several painted murals of hands submerged in the pool, so they haven't ruled out the possibility that it was sunk deliberately. It dates back to the end of the Mayan Golden Age between 830 and 950. And so it may have been left behind as the Mayans retreated back to their strongholds and their satellite towns and cities were abandoned. There's ancient history everywhere you look in Iran, but perhaps no place quite so striking as Kanarak. This ghost town, abandoned for hundreds of years, is 4,000 years old at least. Archaeological digs are carried out at the site regularly, and it seems that the further the experts dig, the more they find. The mud brick buildings that still stand at the site today are closer to 1,000 years old and have slowly been shaped by the elements during that time. The wind has whipped the walls into soft curves, almost as if the ancient buildings are melting. The eeriest of all the buildings in Karanak is the old minaret tower, which stands above a ruined mosque. It shakes, vibrates, and makes an ominous sound even when there's no wind in the area, and scientists have never been able to say why. Despite the historical importance of Karanak, it isn't afforded any official protection. That means anybody's welcome to come here and trample all over the crumbling buildings, some of which are now dangerously close to collapsing. If nothing's done soon, Karanak will probably not be here a hundred years from now. While many of the ancient Mayan monuments and settlements in Mexico have been fully explored, the same can't be said about those in Guatemala. Archaeologists have spent the past few years trying to do something about that, though, and in the process, they've made amazing discoveries like this intricately decorated 1,500-year-old altar. It was found in a ruined Mayan temple in an area almost completely hidden by the Guatemalan jungle near La Corona. Excavating the altar from the tree root that had wrapped around it and exporting it to Guatemala City was a painstaking process that took almost a full year. The limestone altar bears the image of King Chaktuk Ikchak, who was previously unknown to historians. He carried a double-headed serpent in his hands. The presence of the snake is probably tied to the Maya dynasty of Kanu, who were known as the Snake Kings. There are even hieroglyphs on the altar that give the precise date of May 12, 544 for its installation and dedication. Having found evidence of the existence of this long-forgotten king, archaeologists are now looking for a further historical context to his reign. We don't know whether to call the House of the Harpist an ancient wonder or a modern jigsaw puzzle. The house is actually a Roman villa, and it's in the French city of Arles. It's known among archaeologists and historians for its gorgeous frescoes. But the frescoes didn't look like this when they were discovered. 
They'd been smashed to such an extent that they were broken into several hundred thousand pieces. The pieces were put into 800 crates and delivered to a restoration team a little under five years ago, and the team is still working on them today. All the complete frescoes we can see and enjoy today are the fruits of their labor. Archaeologists say that the villa was built around 2,070 years ago, and as such, it was built before the Romans repurposed the entire settlement of Arles to use it as a colony for wounded veterans. The villa would have been surplus to requirements when that happened, so it was probably only occupied for about 20 years. It was destroyed by a large-scale fire, perhaps one that was started deliberately. But the thick layers of ash created by the fire helped to preserve its lower levels, including the frescoes. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.